to chapter 3. It says, Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Back up, back up. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? And so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plan and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant, but as the morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered, and it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on a plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which come up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? And much livestock. God, thank you. God, I pray, Father, for the truth and the power of your word. God, may it illuminate lives. God, I pray that you would literally take my voice over and make it yours. That your name would be edified. Your kingdom would be magnified. I give you great honor for this day, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all all right with this this morning? Ain't nobody going to help me, I know, but this, it's just the way it is. And so I, 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 he, hated, he hated the people. Here's what really bothers me is that God has literally, if the Bible tells, Jesus came and said, the harvest is great. He has already established that the reach is already there. He has already established that the land that you dwell in, in the neighborhoods that you cross, in the roads that you drive down, in the places that you go to work, and where your children go to school are already ripe for the harvest. The problem with us folks inside the church is we start literally evaluating the harvest. And I won't work for something that I don't like. How many of you planted a garden before? Who's planted a garden? Lift it high. Did you ever plant anything that you didn't want in it? You had no problem then when it come harvest time going and getting the things that you planted because you wanted what you planted. But we won't work and, and work the fields of places and things that we don't want that we personally don't like. The problem is, is that we have to evaluate our picture of the king, our ideal picture of the kingdom to make sure it doesn't get in the way of God's picture of the kingdom. But he's angry because he hates folk. I talked the other night about scattering seed. And the church misses a multiplication harvest because we pick through the seed we've been sent to scatter. God says, I've given you a bucket. Took the bucket and spread the seed. And he's like, I want that one, and I want that one, and I want that one, and I'm okay with this one. But I'll go and put that bucket away and let it grow gnats and flies. God's like, but that's where the harvest is. That's where the harvest is. Jonah, angry, angry not with God, angry not with really the, the city that he's being sent to, not even angry at the work that he's going to have to put in, but he hates the people that he's around. Hates the people that God has sent him to. And I'm, I, I really started kind of looking at this and thinking about this, and I'm like, you know, I, I read a quote by a guy named F.W. Faber that says, the love of God is broader than man's mind. Here's the problem then, is that God's love reaches. Man's mind can't seem to, to, to hold it. So we have to begin not to stretch the love of God. We, don't, we, we really need to stop begging for more of God and really start stretching more of my mind because God is already present. God is everywhere and has established the harvest wherever we move. There's not a place that you won't move that there's not a harvest prepared. I've just got to begin to strategize my mind to stretch it to match the love of God. To stretch and match the love of God. So God help work on my mind. 
If you're going to send me to a place called Nineveh, I don't want to hate where I'm going. I need to learn to love the way that you do. I need to learn a complete love. I need to learn a whole love. I don't need to worry about the people, how they look, where they come from, how they were built, well, what, how, what they do, the money they make, how they talk. It makes no difference to me what dialect they have. Matter of fact, I'm not even responding because of them. I'm responding because of you. I've got to develop a fear and a reverence for you that if you talk, I listen. Your voice covers the entirety of the earth that I could walk upon. And if your voice speaks, regardless of where I'm at, it sounds the same. So if I'm in China, it still sounds like you. And if I'm in the hood, it still sounds like you. And if I'm at my job, it still sounds like you. And if I go to Mexico, it still sounds like you. So it makes no difference where you're sending me and who you're sending me to. My response is to you. I cannot let a frustration and an anger that is built inside of me overcome the love that I have for God. So as a church... We've been given, we pray. I, I would dare say that if I asked you, do you want to know your purpose? Everybody in here would raise their hand. The problem is, is what if that purpose carried you to places that, and people that you hated? Let me show you something. Can you go to, go, you know what? Let me stop, stop. Go to uh, Genesis really quickly. I want to show you something. Just, just want to show you something. We have, we have become a very associated bunch of people. That we live and die by our associations and our affiliations. You follow me? If you don't believe me, let's just look what happened about eight months ago in November when we voted. You've been more loyal to your party than you have your kingdom. See, I'm just talking about to the church this morning. We ain't out preaching this on the street corner because the reality is, is this in the church? It's in the church. See, here, here, let me show you something. We've been able to develop a diverse population at this church, and I promise you that's who we'll be. But the thing about it is, is that, is that you can look across here and see people that come from a different spot than where you come from or have a different color than where you came from, and you've learned to make them your Tarshish people. I've developed a trade relationship with them. I might not travel to their country, but we work a trade relationship with inside the church. I say hey to you, you say hey back. I put my arm around you, you put your arm around me back. We post on Facebook, I post back. And we develop a trade relationship between the diversity within our congregation, but somehow we can take that trade relationship and still mask the hate that's inside of us. I ain't picking on y'all, but I'm going to tell you why I know that is because Facebook has become a revealing thing for church folk. Right? I know folk that, you know, hey, Jesus this and bless this on one post and in the next one they talking about this party or that party or this person or that person or this country or this neighborhood or whatever it may be and literally bash it. And it doesn't even have to be anything with color. It may be opinionated. You can sit beside somebody your same color from your same neighborhood making the same money you make, talking the same language, and because you have difference of opinion, you'll hate that person because they don't think the way you do. And I have just broken my opportunity to reach people because I hate the fact that they're different. Let me show you a little something really quickly in Genesis. I want to show you where our, where our, literally our separation, separation or segregation was built in sin. It was not built in purpose. That's right. It was not built, watch me. The whole earth, everybody knows what whole means, right? Everything. The whole earth, the whole earth had one language and one speech. Everybody was alike. It didn't make a difference if you got under the sun a little bit more than the other one did and was a little bit darker. Everybody was alike. The whole earth had one language and one speech. And it come to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Everybody in one place. Everybody in one speech. Everybody really in one mindset of unity. And then they said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and asphalt and mortar. And they said, come let us build, watch, ourselves a city. Why? 
I want it to reach the heavens so that we can make a name for us. Let me just tell you where your anger is driven from. It's driven from a root issue of pride. Then I'm going to look out for me. God understands that man, man together in a unified operation, in a unified mind, in a unified language can do greater things than they could ever imagine. As a matter of fact, God said they'll accomplish what they've put their mind to in this situation. They'll accomplish it because they're unified. The problem is, is that much like in the garden when I had to expel Adam and Eve because they were reaching for a tree of life when they had already been disrupted by a tree of knowledge, I can't let them access eternity in a prideful state. So I must kick them out of the garden until I can reestablish the truth within inside of them. And in the same scenario, he looks and he says, I can't allow them to build their own kingdom seated by their own pride. Sin became the root issue. And out of sin, because they were building a mission based on a wrong product of sin, God said, I'm going to scatter them abroad the face of the whole earth. You follow me? And this is where your ethnicities came from. And this is where your nationalities came from. And this is where your opinions came from. I don't know about hollering with me this morning. God said, I must, I must separate you because together within sin, you'll do something very far powerful. Imagine what you can do if we can come together in the right spirit. Imagine who we can become if we come together within truth. God says, so here's the thing. Here's, here, let me just tell you this. So we get all bent out of shape with people because they were born in a different neck of the woods than we were born in? We get bent out of shape with people and don't, we, we don't, because that's their culture. The problem is, is what you have to see is that their culture and their birthplace was established by their natural birth and not by their rebirth. A rebirth became necessary to accomplish what the natural birth could not. And so while your natural birth gave you your skin color and it gave you your place of birth and it gave you who your mom and daddy was and it gave you your mom and daddy's opinion, God said, that's not enough for me to establish my kingdom. I've got to have a people that's unified by something. And so there became a rebirth to accomplish what the natural birth set out of order. So my rebirth will, will, will literally give you citizenship into a new area code, into a new zip code, into a new bloodline. And what were formerly your opinions based on where you were born are no longer your opinions because you're abound by the principles of the kingdom. And Jesus even said, I cannot speak what I want to speak. I must speak what my father teaches me. So what I think and what I want and the opinions that have been formed, you know the problem is we've learned to love what mama thought more than what God thought. Well, it's just the way it's always been in my family. Well, my God, that's why he gave you a rebirth. It's the way my parents raised me. Well, guess who real daddy is? Go to, go to, uh, go to Matthew. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. I know y'all have heard this. I'm going to show you something about it. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be son. Watch. Until this moment, you can't rightfully be a son. Did that not just invite permission to be a son? You must love your enemies. And you must hate those who persecute you. You must literally embrace those that have a different opinion. You must learn to wrap your arms around those that came from a different neck of the woods. You must learn to reach out and to encourage those who have literally turned their back on you. You must learn to love the very things that you thought you hated in order just to be my son. You know, when you, you, can, you, can, 
you can meet some folks, you can meet my dad, and you can meet my granddad, and you can meet my great granddad, and so on, and, and a lot of them are past now, and you can even look at my children now, and you can tell that my kids are my kids. Anybody that really knows my kids, right, you can tell that my kids are my kids. And you can look at my father, and you can look at my grandfather, and you can look at my great-grandfather, and you can see the resemblance that we're all in the same lineage. There's a reason why. Because the way I look validates my sonship. You don't have to have my birth certificate. You don't have to see where my daddy signed off when I was born to know that that's my father. Why? Because the way I look it literally validates my sonship. Which means then that how do I become, I begin to take the shape of my father. Something has to begin to look like my father. Because my father in heaven is a spirit. It can't be my hairdo or my lack of a hairdo. It can't be my size and my shape. Then something has to begin to transform to validate my sonship. It must look like him on the inside. So I must love my enemies and hate those that persecute me. I must embrace those that turn their back on me. Those who spitefully use me, that I may be a son of the Father in heaven, for he makes his son. Watch, this is what he's, he says, the reality is, is you don't have a reason to be angry about anything because I'm sovereign God. I can make the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and I can make it set on the evil and on the, on the good. It rains on the just, and it rains on the unjust. And if you stay inside of my lineage with my bloodline and my truth and my love, everything will work out for the betterment of your life. You have no reason to be angry. The reality is, is that sometimes the, the reason that we often get angry is because things don't work out the way we want it to. The problem with that is, is we ain't checked with God. Because he's going to look at me and say, why are you angry? Are you still my son? Are you still going where I'm sending you? Are you still speaking what I'm telling you to speak? Are you still carrying my love or have you lost that? I'll cause it to rain on anybody. Watch. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? I'm, I'm, I'm going to set you up right here. Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect. Just like your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, this word perfect means complete. Now follow me. Unless we begin to stretch our mindsets to match the reach of God's love, I don't have the ability to be whole. Been in an altar somewhere praying for years for my body to be healed, but there's still people I hate. Y'all ain't with me, right? Been, been fasting for a long time for my marriage to repair. But I've never repaired my love for those that turn their back on me. So I limit my effectiveness in those that I'm comfortable with because I'm incomplete. Because I have not gone back and closed the circle in the places that I hated. Hey, you're missing that. You're missing that. I become ineffective in the places I thought I was effective. Why? Because the anointing shows no respecter of persons. The anointing doesn't know if they're black or white. The anointing doesn't know if they're Democrat or Republican. The anointing doesn't know if they were born in Mexico or the U.S. The anointing doesn't know if they speak this language or that language. The anointing doesn't know if they have no money or if they have all. The anointing literally is the same for everybody. And so I become ineffective in the places that I want to go and the people I'm not afraid of being around because I have not closed the gap in the places that I hated. God said, in order for you to be effective in every avenue of your life, I'm going to take you back to the places that you hate and the people that you hate so that you can repair your love for them. Why? Because you're not loving them, you're loving me. I've departed. Y'all want to hear this. God loves your enemies. God loves the people that you hate. Let me show you something. Hey, right, who, who's glad they met Lord Jesus this morning? Who's excited that they, they've been resurrected and saved by the King? Let me tell you something. At some point in time, you were somebody's enemy. Thank God. Thank God that God loved somebody else's enemy enough that one day it became me.
God loves your enemies. God loves the people that you hate. And the reality is, is it could be the very place of your greatest harvest. Watch. For those, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Where's the harvest? Where's the harvest in reaching the ones that already have the love? You with me? We want to grow churches and ministries and ideas and businesses and all these things, but we only want to reach to the places that our opinions extend. We, we, we only really uh, to travel the past that we've been down before. And I'm not just talking about spiritually speaking. I'm talking about going in the neighborhoods in the neck of the woods that we ain't afraid to go in. I learned something a long time ago, though. If you'll reach the ones that nobody wants, you'll get the ones everybody wants. Why? Because it's, it literally is a sowing and reaping process that God says if you can feed the ones that are broke, if you, can, if you can literally love the ones that are desolate and ones that are empty, I will send you the ones that have the love in them. If you can, if you can show an investment and encourage somebody that's been down in the dumps, I will send you the one that has all the gifts and the anointing. For what profit is it of you if you just reach the ones that already love you? Let me show you something. God's greatest love. And when God reached down to his greatest love, it was wrapped in his greatest enemy. <laughs> Y'all, you follow me? The reality is, is when you need reaching, you are wrapped in the very thing he hated. When you needed to be rescued and delivered, it wasn't because you already loved him back. It says you love him because he first. It means he reached down and was willing to put himself in an environment because he understood there was a harvest in the hate. So I go back and ask you, what if the greatest harvest of your life, the very things that you've been praying for, the greatest blood to reach your purpose, what if it's located in the very places and the very people that you hate? Watch. The Bible says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What established my soul was love. What does it profit me to gain everything that I've been willing to scatter but lose the very thing that makes me? See, here, here's, here, let, me, let me just show you. Here's, here's, here's our problem with inside the church is that we, we don't have a problem reaching to the people that we, we don't worry about rubbing shoulders with and using our gift on them. The problem is, is that we a lot of times are putting our gift on display without no anointing. We wonder why I can't pray and reach my children because you're hating somebody else's. See, I want God to reach my husband or my wife and you going to work every day with somebody else's husband or wife that they've been praying for and you won't speak to them because they voted different from you. God says, my desire is that you be complete. Which mean, here's, here's what it means by complete, is that I'm wholly functioning and nothing ever, literally, I don't change regardless of my environment. It means my love is the same whether I'm here or if I'm in Peru or if I'm over in the west side of town, if I'm in Homeland Park. If I'm in Powdersville, or if I'm in Greenville, if I go down to Mexico, or if I go over to Arkansas, it means my love is the same. I might not know you, and you may come from a different neck of the woods. You may not have what I have. We may look different. We may dress different. We may talk different, but I love you the same. Why? Because you're the image of God. We have to shift our response. Who wants, I mean, we, we, don't we pray? Jesus taught us, to, taught, teach us to pray. 
let, let the kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? That's what we pray. God, let your kingdom fall. We want to bring your kingdom to earth. The problem is, is we pray to bring the kingdom to earth, but we don't embrace its culture. How do you manifest something that you don't understand? You can only reproduce what you are. You with me? If I'm a watermelon seed, I can only give you a watermelon. I can't, I can't force a cantaloupe out of my watermelon seed. It's impossible. I can only reproduce what I am. And so the reality is, is if I'm not seeing the, the kingdom manifest on earth in front of me, maybe I need to challenge with whether I understand this culture or not. Maybe I begin to, let me start back at the very place that God is there hate inside of my heart. We pray, God, manifest my, I want to grow my gift. I want to grow my anointing. I want to grow, all, I want to grow my wisdom. I want to grow my understanding. I want to grow my reach. I want to grow my influence. I want to grow my ability to pray deeper. And God's like, I just want you to grow your love. Watch, watch. First Corinthians, go there real quick. I'm going to let y'all out of here with this. I'm, I know I'm hurting you. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries. I have all the knowledge. And watch, I even have all the faith. I have all the faith. I can trust God for anything until he sends me to a people I hate. I don't have a problem putting my gifts on display. I have a problem with breaking the yoke of bondage because I lack its anointing. I could remove mountains. Y'all got to follow what it's saying. It's literally telling you that miracles will manifest. Miracles will manifest without, without love. Miracles will manifest without the anointing. That's why a miracle can manifest in a place of bondage. The miracle manifests and it goes back to a place of bondage. That's why we got... Oh, I'm going to get there. That's why we got... We have shifted to an emotional uh, draw inside of church and lack love. I'm talking about real love. We have shifted to an emotional draw, and that's why I can bring you into an emotional environment and literally encourage you or manipulate you to raise your hand and believe you've accepted Christ, but yet not disciple the love out of your life. And six months later, what once was a celebration now becomes bondage again. And it's why you walk to an altar and you pray and you leave and you come back the next Sunday and you're at the altar again. And it's why you get up and celebrate that God broke something off my life. But he did not change my love. I did not change my love for man. I did not change the hatred that was inside of me. And because I did not remove the hatred, sin still had a root. And so the very things I need out of my life, the very things I need deliverance from, I wasn't willing to break the root of it. Because my perspective was that the root was built in a first cigarette somewhere. No, the root was built in a hate. I can have all these things, but if I have not love, I can put my gift on display and I can preach the house down. I can sing, man, till the birds want my voice. I can go to the nations, pray for children and feed them. I can prophesy and speak into your life. I can lay my hands on you and you get healed. But if I have not love, what I have really sown is a root of sin. So that while I thought I was preaching freedom in your life, I was really laying my bondage on you. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. It profits me nothing. We've got to, I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to grow this thing and it be a mask. You follow me? 
I don't want to have diversity in these chairs and it be a mask. There's a reason I'm preaching this to you today. I promise you, I can go a lot of different places and I wrestle with this thing, man. I didn't even know how it was going to come out when I got up here. But I know this is something the enemy bat- is literally battling us with. I don't want you coming and sitting over here and this one sitting over there and not having legitimate love in your heart. I don't want us creating a picture of diversity, but we do not have the completeness of God's Spirit. I want rejuvenate folk to be able to walk into any environment and literally break hell loose. Can I promise you something? That if you can learn how to love completely and become the legitimate son of God, hell will beg for you not to enter their environment when it sees you coming. Are you following me? The demons looked at Jesus and said, not yet. It ain't our time. Don't, I see what, there's a complete love. Ah, oh man, I feel the power of the Holy. I, there's a complete love in you. I realize that there, there is no gap in who you are. And because there is no gap in who you are, I don't have anything to attack. I realize then that what I face is the worst match I could ever face. I, I don't want you in my environment. I realize there's nothing I can do to you. I can't attack you. I can't persecute you. I can't bring sickness and disease upon you because there is nothing that can withstand the love that's in your heart. That's the kind of folk that we become the sons of God. Why? Because I learn how to love my enemies and hate those that persecute me. I learned to forgive those that turn their back on me. Come on, we all, we all got this place. I can guarantee you that every mind in this place right now, you're running to that place of the person that you know you just really can't stand. Because we got them. I'm not telling you that you won't have legitimate emotions and feelings. You will of people that do you wrong, business deals gone bad, relationships broken, people talking, you you, you will deal with those legitimate emotions and feelings, but it cannot be your author. It cannot be your God. I know God is looking for a people. He said something to it when Jesus was having a conversation with a woman at the well. He said, the Father seeks a worshiper. That worshiper, the only thing that makes them a legitimate worshiper is that they worship in spirit and in truth. Whose spirit? God's spirit. It must be a replication of who he is. And if I'm not true with my own self, I can't be true with God. If I'm not true with what I hate, I cannot be true with God. God says, that's, I'm seeking people. I'm seeking the people that have no chink in their armor. I'm, see, I'm not talking about people that you can have hang-ups and you can, st- you can still be dealing with an addiction and have the love of God in your heart and I promise you will break that thing off your life. We got to grow up, but we're too worried about growing up on the outside and the inside. We're too worried about trying to put off the things that everybody else sees rather than evaluating what God sees. God told Samuel, I don't look on the appearance of man. I look on the inside of man. I can literally anoint him king based on what I see on the inside. He can be still feeding sheep and shoveling dung and doing all that, but I can look on the inside and see that there's a completeness inside of his heart. That man's going to be the same man regardless of the environment I put him in. Even when he steps in front of a man that wants to throw a spear at him and kill him, when he has a chance to kill him back, he'll have mercy on him. love your greatest your greatest harvest your greatest harvest as it mimics the pattern of the kingdom your greatest harvest will come from rectifying the things in your life that you hate come on lift your hands to them in this house hallelujah God I know I did not expect God to have the house shout down this morning, but I did expect for minds to be challenged. 
I did expect, God, for people to be stretched. The reality is, God, is that, Father, we need to be willing to be stretched. Our minds, our, our mindsets, our thought patterns need to, need to be willing to be stretched and shaped until it reaches the capacity of your love's extension. Don't let me stop short. Don't let my mind and my spirit stop short of your reach. I limit the return, God, of the kingdom. I limit the return of my life, God, when my mind will not allow me to go places that your arms and your harvest already are. For the harvest is already present. Keep your eyes closed. I want, I want to say it. The harvest, he says the laborers are few. And here's what I begin to, to, to think about and God began to reveal to me. Is that the laborers were few and we tend to run. We use this in the churches. Well, there's, there ain't enough people to serve and, and God really challenged me. And he said, Jason, this is what's sad. It is not just those that aren't willing to work. It's those that don't have the heart to work. Imagine how small then the laborers are if the harvest is plenty and those that have the heart for the harvest are few. Stretch my heart to match the harvest in Jesus' name. Come on, let that be your prayer this morning. Stretch my heart for the harvest in Jesus' name. Stretch my heart, God. God, I don't want to limit your effectiveness through my life. I don't want to limit, God, the multiplication, Father, of the kingdom because of the hate I have in my life. Stretch my heart, God, to match your harvest. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop right here and say this. I want to pray for you this morning, literally, and I don't just mean I, your, your heart isn't any hate, but if you've got sickness, if you've got disease, if you've got marriage issues, if you need an answer for something, I don't care what it is. I had, God's begun to stir in me that we need to create opportunities for the radical display of God. I don't want to limit that, so I don't care what it is. If you need healing in your body this morning, I want you to come see me need healing in your mind this morning, I want you to come see me. If you need an answer, I want you to come see me. Is there anybody I can pray for? I'm probably going to do this a lot more, amen. I'm going to probably do this a lot more than, in, in the future than what I've done in the past, but I'm going to create opportunities for God to display himself. like dominoes. One falls and they all fall. I know there is. I know there is. Tommy, can you help me pray? Denise, Serena, let me stop right here and say this. I want to thank God that my wife is back with me today. Now here's what I want to tell you is that she still has uh, a, a lot longer to go in her recovery. But we are three and almost a half weeks from surgery day. And she has had one migraine. <laughs> one. Y'all don't understand what that means from, for our life. have her right there with me. Hallelujah. I'm going to come through and pray for you. The rest of you, I'd love for you to stick around, but if you can't, I understand you guys can go, but I'm going to lay my hands on these folks and I'm going to pray for them. And I'm believe that God, I want you to help me believe that God is going to answer every request. I don't believe he opened the opportunity without being prepared to meet the need in their life. Help me pray for them. You have been listening to the Rejuvenate Church Broadcast. 
If you shared in today's service with us, visit us at www.rejuvenatechurch.com and send us a message. We would love to hear from you. Rejuvenate Church invites you to be our guest if you're in the upstate of South Carolina. We are located in Anderson, South Carolina, inside the Anderson Mall across from Books A Million. Our service times are Sundays at 1045 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. For up-to-date information, visit our website or connect with us on social media. We are found on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Pastor Jason Wilson and Rejuvenate Church desire to bridge the gap that divides race, age, and economic status. We are transforming culture by engaging and shaping men and women through relationships and positive kingdom influences. Thank you for listening. We look forward to the opportunity to share with you again at Rejuvenate Church.